My name is Noreen Plunkett. I'm going to be speaking about negotiation now. I'm going to be giving another talk in the next session. If you were not expecting a negotiation talk, I will not be upset if you walk out. Come back to me later. Um, who am I? I am a technical writer, a world traveler, um, and a scholarship winner 10 years ago for a book called Women Don't Ask. Uh, and the way I won that scholarship was by asking for the book, Women Don't Ask. Um, <laughs> And that was not the first negotiation I had, I had done. It was not even the first negotiation I had had to think about. Um, but it certainly set me on a road that has ended up with me here today. Um, how many of you have negotiated something in the last week? Those of you who haven't negotiated anything in the last week, how many of you have had to deal with people in the last week? How many of you have had to deal with people you might have wanted to get something from, or do something with, or collaborate with in any way. Yet yeah, those were negotiations, whether or not you knew it. Um, we often think of negotiation as, as a conflict or a fight. Um, the type of negotiation I prefer to engage in, and it's almost always possible to move around to this type of negotiation with a little bit of openness and honesty and trust, is principled negotiation. Um, principled negotiation is a dialogue that's intended to reach a mutually positive outcome. So it doesn't mean getting the other person to do what you want them to do, and it doesn't mean giving in and doing what they want you to do, um, but it's a, it's a back and forth intended to get to somewhere that both of you are happy with, and, and both can also be more than two. Uh, there are four main points, as we see, to, to principled negotiation. Issues should be decided on their merits, rather than being influenced by emotions or by the individuals who are involved. The underlying interests and motivations that drive individuals are often quite similar. And so looking at it as a conflict and looking at push-pull actually ends up getting worse outcomes for everybody. Um, by focusing on the interests rather than your positions, you can see that you're not as opposed as you might originally have assumed you were. Um, sometimes people will focus quite narrowly when generating ideas of how we can move forward. You, for example, if you're brainstorming, judging the ideas as they're coming out tends to lead to a narrower scope and, and fewer, you know, really interesting possibilities or ways to move forward. Um, if you're, for example, if you're buying a house, it's not simply who's going to give me the most money for the house, but for example, I put in an offer on a house just yesterday, which was below the asking price, but I wasn't asking for closing costs and I wasn't asking the sellers to fix up something that we all knew needed to be fixed up. So my offer is significantly simpler for them than some of the other offers they might have on the table. So why would you engage in negotiation? Well, it's right there in the title of the talk. Um, what would you do if you could do anything? I've worked for MIT's Media Lab in Europe. I've worked for Google and for Microsoft. I've been a research assistant working on better ways of predicting dog races than the bookies have. Um, and right now I have a six-figure job with unlimited vacation. So I think those are pretty compelling arguments to negotiate. Um, I've done urban exploration in the buildings that were occupied by Eamon de Valera, the Irish revolutionary, during the 1916 Rising. He was the only male revolutionary who was not put to death. Uh, he was not a British subject and therefore could not, be could not be found guilty of treason against the British Empire. So thank you, America, for keeping him alive to become our first Taoiseach and our third president. Um, I've represented my country at an international music festival. I've had lunch with my president. I've chaired sessions of the Model European Parliament in our House of Representatives. And I've gotten all of these things because I've been willing to negotiate. It's not even always about what I want. Uh, my CEO right now thinks I am a wizard. Uh, because two weeks ago we had our company All Hands. Uh, we stayed in a hotel in Malibu. And, and on the second night, our official evening entertainment was you know, karaoke in this beautiful Malibu ranch until 10 o'clock, bus back to the hotel, after party in the CEO's room. About half past 12, security comes around and says, you know, you're really going to have to break up this party now. It's not working, you know, it's a bit noisy. And we kind of looked around. We saw that there weren't actually any other rooms around us. Uh, we, were, we were underneath the gym, and we were, we were in a fairly sort of separate part of the hotel. Uh, being the CEO, he had a very nice suite. And, and so we decided that... We would take security's advisement as an advisement, and we would continue on with the party. 
And at about one o'clock, security came back and I answered the door and I had a little word with them. And at about two o'clock, they came back and told us that they were going to have to call the police or ask us all to leave. And finally, at three o'clock, they came back and I said, yes, yes, and I, and I brought the rest of the party out with me. And my CEO still doesn't know how we managed to keep the party going until three o'clock in the morning. The answer is tact. Tact is the art of making a point without making an enemy. Or, according to the OED, the faculty of saying or doing the right thing at the right time. Those of you in this room who've met me before will know that I can be outspoken, I can be forthright, I can be strong, I can be snarky, and none of those things are in opposition to being tactful. Being tactful is about choosing the right thing to do in the moment. Particularly when dealing with engineers, being tactful is often idempotent with being straightforward and clear. Uh, it gets you what you want, and it lets you make more together with other people. If we model negotiations based on relationships and the outcomes we're looking for, we get f five quadrants. This is Portland. Um, <laughs> If the outcome isn't important and the relationship isn't important, we essentially avoid negotiating. If the outcome isn't important and the relationship is important, we become accommodating. We'll tr do our best to get whatever the other person needs. You know, we we try, and, try and make things easy. As long as the outcome genuinely isn't important, that's a, that's a fine place to be. But you can't stay there forever. There will be things that come up that are important. Uh, compromising is somewhere in the middle. Again, that's a fine place to visit, but it's not super interesting to talk about from a negotiation point of view. Where it really gets interesting is, is on this top layer, where the outcome is important to you. If the relationship isn't important, but the outcome is, that's competitive negotiations. One of the most formative negotiations I ever made was in that quadrant, and I'm still ashamed of what I did. I was 11 years old, and I was, on, I was on Bali, an Indonesian island, um, and I really wanted this beautiful wooden boat. And I ended up negotiating for this boat, which I truly had my heart set on, and negotiating it, frankly, down to a completely unreasonable price and the exchange of a, of a Qantas wallet that I had gotten for free on the flight as part of the Keep the Children Quiet kit. Um, and, and my behavior that day was, was innocent, but nothing I'm proud of. Um, other, other negotiations I've had in that quadrant that I am proud of, I've previously worked uh, as a, an emergency first responder and as a first aider. And when you're dealing, for example, with a patient who's in a hypoglycemic crisis, they can be very aggressive, they can be confrontational. You need them to take sugar. Don't need them to like you. You don't need them to be happy to deal with you again. You just need to get some sugar into them. And in those cases, Sticking in that quadrant is absolutely fine. However, if the outcome is important, pardon me, and the relationship is also important, I seem to have lost my mouse. Oh well. Um, we want to be in this collaborative quarter. Uh, and so we want to be working together. As I said, we saw the principles earlier. Um, the idea is that instead of this being a, a win-lose scenario or you know, the zero-sum game, we want to expand the pie. Um, when we, when we think about negotiation, we think sometimes, OK, well, if I'm going to get more of this, you're going to get less of it. Or if you're going to get more of this, then I'm going to get less of it. But actually, if we work together, we can make something that's bigger than what we had in the first place. Um, I want to play a little game with you just for a moment. And I'd like you to pair up. You're going to need to put down laptops. Um, so if you just, just find a pair, find somebody beside you. OK, and there's no talking, please. Okay. Now, I want you to take your partner's hand. Okay, no talking. I'm afraid I can't play. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that's all right. If, if you don't have a partner, just, just watch. Um, and think about, think about how you would behave with a partner. Um, now, we're going to pretend we have imaginary tables, okay? And every time your partner's hand touches the table, you get a point, okay? And I want you to count how many points you get. Just, it's an imaginary table, okay? And be gentle with each other, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do three, two, one, go, and then I'm gonna give you 10 seconds and count how many points you get in those 10 seconds, okay? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Stop. 
fucked up? Okay. Okay, first of all, who got, one, who got at least one point? Most, no, half of you, only about half of you got one point. Okay. Um, who got 10 points? Or more than 10? Close? Six? Six? Nine? Seven? Okay. Who's played this? <laughs> Even as a group, what did you get as a group? That's, I mean, it's good. It's okay. Yeah. Um, who's played this game before? It's a few people, I think, have played this game before. Okay. That, no, that's fine. That's fine. Who decided it was an arm wrestle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it looks like one on the screen. Right. Sure, but I didn't say that had anything to do with it. I mean, I mean, this looks like a crazy, I don't know, Halloween <laughs> night, nightmare before Christmas sort of thing. And, and it, yeah, so it was suggestive, absolutely. But you need to question your assumptions. Um, I saw some people who had played this game before, you know, making eye contact with each other and realizing that, okay, what we have to do is I'll help you and you'll help me. I didn't see anybody let go of hands. I told you to take each other's hands. I didn't say you had to keep each other's hands. The real way to get, you know, the big points. <laughs> um, so there's two different ways of approaching this negotiation and, and many negotiations. I don't have good names for them. But I think you can work out which one, uh, which one I like better. Um, and, and when you start with assumptions like, you win, I lose, you go in with the goal of beating the other person. This is the competitive strategy. Hopefully nobody got hurt during this. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, and the result is you get one or two points. Maybe you don't even get one or two points. Uh, when you go in working with your partner and seeing, okay, well, I want to get 10 points, but it's okay if you get 10 points too, then you can attack the problem and respect the people that you're dealing with and you come out with a much better outcome. So if the goal of this more pie strategy is to get an overall good result, we also have to know what an overall good result looks like. Um, how do you define success? If you define success as getting more than the other person or giving away less than they do, then you're going to end up in this narrow, narrow stretch of possibilities where it's all about, okay, this, you know, the zero sum. And, and you lose out on so many more things that you could be getting just because you're trying to keep them from getting as much as they can get. Um, there are times when your need really is, I want more than the other person. Those are not negotiations. Those are times you should take a time out, relax, have a piece of chocolate, whatever it is you need to do, and, and deal with your emotional state. Um, positional arguments like that are very, very easy to get deadlocked in, and they result in solutions that aren't really solutions at all. You get more than the other person does, but you still end up miserable and unhappy. Um, at best, everybody gets away equally miserable. So the Harvard Negotiation Project has an eight-point framework for defining success. And these slides will be up later, and, and these, these points are available online, although I think I may have made them shorter. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm looking at my notes going. Th these were written at 4 AM, and so they're not totally clear. When I'm negotiating with security, when I'm negotiating with security in the hotel that I was telling you about earlier, um, my needs and security's needs are reasonably clear. I need the party to continue because I'm having a great time. Security needs to make sure there aren't noise complaints from the other guests, make sure that nobody is being drunk and belligerent and, and destroying the room. Um, but what about the needs of, say, my colleagues? What about the needs of the people around us? What, what are the other needs that are going on that are not directly represented in that negotiation? Um, and what are the possible solutions we can come up with? Maybe we can quiet the party down. Maybe we can move the party outside. Maybe we can end up in the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning drinking Mad Dog 2020. Not that I would ever advise that, but um, the VP of Engineering thought that was a good plan. Uh, <laughs> where can we trade off based on complementary interests? And what benchmarks can we use to handle conflicting interests? Because if we'd say, well, I have to feel good about it, Feeling good is very subjective and very hard to measure. 
If we say, well, it has to be fair and we can show fairness in this way or that way, then we can measure that and make sure that the outcome is in fact fair. And of course, it's always useful to look at how other people have solved similar problems. So let's talk for a second about communication. As a general rule, there are four main modes of communication. We have inquiry, so asking questions in order to learn something. Paraphrasing, summarizing and ensuring that the message that was received matches the message that was transmitted. Acknowledgement, which is not necessarily agreeing with the person you're communicating with, but making sure that you have heard what they're saying, acknowledging what they're saying, making sure that they understand that you have received the message, even if you don't agree with it. And then advocacy, which is explaining your own point of view. And if you find yourself in a position of advocacy, it's a bit long for this talk, but you should check out Charles's Rules of Argument. Charles's Rules of Argument essentially state that you have two passes. You can explain your case, you can explain you know, your position and what you think and, and where you want it to be. You can let the other person respond, and then you can go one more time to clarify any misunderstandings, then you're done. Then it's over, you have to walk. Or you have to move into one of these other modes of inquiry, acknowledgement, or paraphrasing. Because this, this advocacy, this pushing, this I'm explaining to you how I feel, is never going to get anybody on board. It's the other three modes of communication that will get somebody on board. Sometimes, despite all of your efforts to expand the pie, to brainstorm on possible solutions, to, to, to you know, move outside the box, you end up getting nowhere. And there can be a variety of reasons for this. Um, not having all the information, seeing things differently, where you, have, you think you have all the information, but in fact, there's a culture clash going on, or there's, you know, there are different things happening that you haven't heard of. Um, especially in communities that are made up of people from different backgrounds. There can be misunderstandings, uh, different uses of language can be a huge issue. In that situation, it's vastly, vastly in your own interests to be curious, to ask questions, and to genuinely listen to the answers to those questions. Whether it's an interpersonal negotiation, whether it's a team negotiation, whether it's a negotiation with a company, anything that involves working with another person, Assume intelligence and good intent and ask about everything else. You will sometimes find that those assumptions are unwarranted, and I'm sorry about that. But if you assume and work from there, you'll do much better than if you assume the opposite and end up annoying everybody and, and not getting where you need to go. What are the things to be curious about? What are your own wants and needs and hopes and objectives. Because you have to be honest with yourself about what you're really looking for. And then what do you think the other party's needs and wants and hopes are? Not only what do you think they are, but also be curious and ask them what they think they are. Um, it's not about your opinions or your positions. It's about, if you go in knowing how you want something to be achieved, then you're not open to things that might lead to a better outcome. Uh, the company I'm working for, when I was first negotiating with them, uh, on, they, had, they had offered me a job and I, I'm, I'm new here in the US from Europe. There was no way in the world I was going to handle three weeks vacation. It's June and I've already taken five. Um, and so I said to them straight up front, can I work 80% time? Can you just, you know, I'm happy, we can negotiate the money, that's fine, um, but I, I don't want to be working 100% for you. And for various reasons, they were not happy with that. They didn't want me working 80%. But because we were discussing our interests and rather our positions, I was able to understand that what they, what they didn't want was me working for anybody else. They were fine if I was only working 40 weeks a year. That's no problem. They didn't want me spending my energy and my time with another company or another job uh, outside of what I was doing for them. And so that was, that was easy to come to a resolution. And in fact, we now have a standard, the, the company policy is you can take as much vacation as you like. If you're not taking three weeks a year, please see upper management because there's something wrong. Um, we have a Finnish CEO, so 
works out well. <laughs> um, when you know what your wants and needs and concerns are and what the wants and needs and concerns of the other party are, what is the priority of these things? What is the most important, the next most important, the least important, the stuff you really don't care about? Um, and how sure are you of the other party's wants and the priority of those wants? And finally, what are the third parties that you need to consider? For example, when I have unlimited vacation, I need not only to keep my boss happy, but also my team and the other teams that rely on my work. Um, once you have as much information as you can get, then you can start to break down the barriers to cooperation. When you find yourself in a conflict, the other person is, whether they're, whether they're intentionally or not, they're disagreeing, they're in, in an advocacy mode and so on, we get into the don'ts. So don't react. Don't react on an emotional level, even if their approach is emotional. Calm down, buy some time, don't decide right now. Don't argue. Give the other person, the other party, a hearing. Listen to what they're saying, acknowledge their emotion without feeling the need to refute it or tell them they're wrong or tell them that's not how it is. Acknowledge their personhood, their, their you know, individuality, their need to be seen. Um, acknowledge their authority and their competence, even if you don't necessarily believe in those things. Um, collect yeses. Any of you who've done improv may have played a yes and game, where instead of saying, no, 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 but, in order to, to change the direction, you say, yes, and. And you can still change the direction. You can still move where the conversation is going. But by building up this positivity, you get, you get the other person on board, and you're able to move forward together. Um, don't reject things. Ask more questions. Problem solving. Why do you feel that way? Why not do it this way? What if we did? Again, the inquiry, getting, getting people outside this box of there is only one way and you, know, you have to lose if I'm going to win. Um, don't push. Those of you who have, have had to work with um, particularly East Asian cultures may have heard about this concept of face. Turns out it is absolutely equally important in Western cultures. It's just that we don't speak as openly about it. Um, nobody wants to be backed into a corner. Build on the other person's ideas, offer choices, ask for constructive criticism. Ask them, well, what would you change about this? How would you do it differently? <laughs> Get them on board. Rather than coming in with, here's my plan, and here's your plan, and let's try and merge them, work on one plan together. And don't escalate. Don't threaten. Warn them if necessary. Let them know what your alternatives are if you think your alternative is better than what they're currently offering. Uh, ask about outcomes. Again, this is all about questions. What will you do if? What do you think I will do if? Um, and now we're going to get onto the part that uh, when I first proposed this talk, I had intended on making it much more about um, negotiating between individuals and companies and job negotiations and so on. And as I started working on it, I realized that really the principles are a lot the same. Um, there are some things that I, that I have covered elsewhere and I think it's helpful to go into detail in. And so I'd ask any of you who are taking notes or tweeting or, or so on like that, please, none of this goes public from now on. We're going to turn off the recording. I'm going to